Tatalói. for joining us today to hear our brilliant panelists discuss the deadly sanctions on Iran, the embargo on Gaza, and the Iraq sanctions. My name is Seema Shahzari, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Minnesota and a member of the No Sanctions on Iran Coalition. The No Sanctions on Iran Coalition is a grassroots and volunteer-run group of feminist scholars, artists, and activists who consider the US sanctions to be war by another name. We condemn sanctions on Iran and stand in solidarity with other peoples who are subjected to deadly sanctions from Gaza to Venezuela. We build coalitions with a wide range of organizations and individuals who seek to lift the sanctions on Iran. My deep gratitude to our panelists, Noura Erakat, Negar Mortezavi, Asal Rod, and Zainab Saleh, who have accepted to share their expertise and immense knowledge with us today. Before my colleague Niki Achavan reads our panelists' bios, I would like to thank all of my friends and comrades at the No Sanctions on Iran Coalition for their labor of love, especially Niki Achavan, Katayun Amjadi, Sara Musaifer, Kosar Gohari, Maryam Hushyar, Abrara Rageh, and all of our friends who have sent us videos of themselves speaking up against the sanctions on Iran. 
Many thanks to Jordan Lee Thompson for his help with this webinar, um, to Caption Max for live captioning, and to our friends at Jedalia and Nayak for broadcasting this webinar live. Heartfelt gratitude to my colleagues at Imagining Transnational Solidarities Research Circle, Richa Nagar and Amina Bujinkic, for agreeing to host this Zoom webinar. And a special thank you to our chat moderators, brilliant UMN doctoral candidates, Sara Musaifer and Nithya Rajan, who are also members of Agitate and ITSRC, Lara Keswani from uh, the Arab Resource and Organizing Center, and talented Minneapolis-based artist Katayun Amjadi and Aida Shah Hosami. Many thanks to uh, all of our co-sponsors, ITSRC, Agitate, Jadalia, Middle East Research and Information Project, or MERIP, NIAC, which is the National Iranian American Council, Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, Arab Resource and Organizing Center, MISNA, Peace Action, Rethinking Foreign Policy, Win Without War, Femina, not to be mistaken with Femin, Coal Journal, Democratic Socials of America in San Francisco, Middle East and Islamic Studies at George Mason, George Mason University, Trans Balkanska Solidar Nost, Alliance of Progressive South Asians, and last but not least, Madre, who gave us a small grant which has helped us with our campaign. We are indebted to our artist friends for adding so much beauty to this campaign. Aida Shah Hosami generously recorded the most beautiful cover of the song Bahar, which you heard earlier. Of course, the song was originally written and composed by Mohammed Haideri and sang by the legendary Haide. But Aida's magical voice makes this cover even more touching than the original version, in my opinion. Also, deep gratitude to our resident artist and coalition member, Katayun Amjadi, whose inimitable art uh, you can win in a raffle on our Global Day of Action on March 21st. We invite all of you to join us by posting the hashtag no sanctions on Iran on your social media on our Global Day of Action. Our hope is to mobilize thousands of people posting the same hashtag so that we can make some noise. If you do two things, follow our social media um, platforms and use the hashtag uh, no sanctions on Iran and tag us on March 21st, you can win a masterfully handcrafted and ironic art piece by Kato Yoon or a no sanctions and no war uh, on Iran t-shirt or a tote bag designed by the amazing Hamid Rahmanian. That will be our coalition's AD or Noru's present to you. So please join us by posting the hashtag no sanctions on Iran on March 21st, a day after Noru's. Uh, there's one last thank you, and that is to Ali Azimi for allowing us to use his music video, which you also saw and heard before we went live. The lyrics of the song Noru's Turahe are from a children's book by Samin Bakhshaban. Ali Azimi composed that song after his co uh, cousin, Golnar Shahbaz Zadeh, the beautiful woman who saw in the music video, who was a teacher and a singer, died of cancer in 2014. Golnar, who did not live to see the video, was one among thousands of cancer patients who suffer the consequences of the deadly sanctions on Iran. Those of us who have lost loved ones to cancer in Iran know the devastating impact of sanctions um, on people with cancer. Let's think of this webinar as a tribute to those who have lost their lives because of sanctions and embargoes in the Middle East and elsewhere. This is an apt day for this tribute, especially that it is Charshambe Suri, the eve of the last Wednesday of the year, according to the Iranian calendar, when Iranians jump over fire to rid themselves of bad energy and sickness. The tradition of Qashuq Zani, banging on pots and pans with a spoon, signifies calling on the dead to be with us as the year ends as, uh, and as a new year is about to come. This Chashambe Suri, we call on those who have departed, especially those who have died as the direct result of the sanctions and embargoes and the violence and corruption that ensues from them. We cherish the memory of our dead 
celebrate the arrival of Nauru's with their co-presence and make the commitment to demand an end to deadly sanctions and embargoes because we believe that the lives of our people matter. Thank you. Now I will pass it to my colleague, Nikki Akhavan, to read the bio of our uh, panelists. Hello and every, uh, welcome to everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce our very accomplished panelists. Let me very briefly introduce myself. My name is Nikki Akhavan. I'm a professor of media and communication studies at Catholic University, and I'm a member of this coalition. Um, our panelists are so accomplished that I will only be able to read just a snippet of their uh, uh, bios, but our moderators will be putting links to their full bios in the chat if you'd like to learn more about them. So I will begin with uh, Asal Rod, has her PhD in Middle Eastern history from the University of California at Irvine. She's a senior research fellow with the National Iranian American Council, where she works on Iran policy issues and US-Iran relations. Her writing can be found in Newsweek, The National Interest, Foreign Policy, and Res Responsible Statecraft. And she's also appeared as a commentator on the BBC, Al Jazeera, and NPR. Uh, Zainab Saleh is our other panelist. She's an assistant professor of anthro anthropology at Haverford College. Her research focuses on memory, nostalgia, belonging, war, and violence in Iraq and the Iraqi diaspora. She's the author of Return to Ruin, Iraqi Narratives of Exile and Nostalgia. And she's now working on a book project called Uprooted Memories, Citizenship, Denaturalization, and Deportation in Iraq, which focuses on the deportation of Iraqi uh, Jews, Iraqis of Iranian origin, and communists throughout the 20th century. Noura Erkot is a human rights attorney and an assistant professor at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, in the Department of Africana Studies and the Program in Criminal Justice. She's the author of Justice for Some, Law, and the Question of Palestine. She's also co-founding editor of Jadalia, one of our co-sponsors. Thank you, Jadalia an electronic magazine on the Middle East that combines scholarly expertise and local knowledge. Her work and interviews can be found on Washington Post, uh, New York Times, CNN, LA Times, Marip, uh, Al Jazeera, among many uh, other places. And last but not least, uh, Negar Mortazavi is a journalist and political an analyst who's been covering Iranian affairs and US-Iran relations for over a decade. She's a columnist for The Independent and a host of the Iran podcast. She's a frequent media analyst on Iran and US foreign policy, also appearing on CNN, MSNBC, NPR, BBC, France 24, and many other international outlets. And just last week, she was recognized by Forbes magazine and a list of 30 inspirational women who are doing boundary breaking work. So congrats on that, Nigar, and welcome. And we will jump right into our questions with Seema asking the first one. Thank you, Nikki John, my mic was off, I'm sorry. Um, so Zainab, uh, the first question is for you, but before I ask the question, just a reminder um, to our audience that we will be taking questions in the Q&A uh, at the last 15 minutes, um, uh, we will ask those questions. So please type your questions in the Q&A. Um, and our chat moderators are posting links to our website, to our social media, um, also to bios of our speakers. So please read the chat for information about our Global Day of Action, our website, and um, also about our panelists. Um, Zainab, the UN sanctions on Iraq in the 90s killed um, over 500,000 children before the US military invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, yet some people uh, argue that sanctions are not as violent as wars. Uh, you live through the sanctions as a teenager and your book, Return to Ruin, narrates memories of life under Saddam's regime and the sanctions regime. Could you please talk about what sanctions did in Iraq and who suffered the most? You and other Iraqi feminist uh, scholars have talked about how war and sanctions in Iraq deteriorated women's situations, uh, women's situation. Could you elaborate on that and also talk about war and sanction profiteers and the long-term effects of sanctions on the Iraqi people? Great, thank you very much, Seema, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this panel. 
Um, so Roy Gordon described, in fact, the sanctions of, on Iraq from uh, 1990 to 2003 as an invisible war that was waged by the United States and Britain on Iraq. Because even though the United, State, uh, the United Nations has imposed the sanctions on Iraq after the invasion of Kuwait, the United States and Britain played a huge role in vetoing any efforts to lift the sanctions on Iraq. And the sanctions had really devastating impact uh, on um, on Iraqis as Sima said uh, almost half a million people uh, half a million children have died by 1996 this is the uh, quote when Madeleine Albright was asked on 60 minutes if the if the death of uh, half a million children was worth it and she famously said yes the price is worth it so so the sanction really impacts people and doesn't impact governments so one of the things that that happened in Iraq is that Saddam Hussein and his clique uh, became extremely rich while people suffered uh, under the sanctions. So the sanctions really aim to debilitate the whole population and produces conditions of slow death while the governments profit on, be, uh, on the back of people. Um, and one of the um, impact of the sanctions um, is that the really the collapse of the educational and the healthcare systems in Iraq in the 90s and the early 2000s. Uh, so one of the things that uh, uh, happened with the sanctions and I, people, I think people are un, unaware of it because when people think of sanctions, they just think, oh, these sanctions are targeting governments. But really what the sanctions do is that the, uh, is that it really undermine the whole system. And one of the things that happened is inflation. So one, so the Iraqi dinar collapsed totally during the sanctions and people lost uh, the power, like the, the value of uh, salaries and the savings totally disappeared. So for example, one Iraqi dinar used to equal $3 in 1990, after the sanction, uh, one dollar equaled uh, uh, 1,500 Iraqi dinars. So people's saving really collapsed, and people could no longer afford to buy food. So that really became a, prob uh, a struggle for people to make ends meet in order to be able to find food. And what really prevented a mass starvation in Iraq at the time was the ration that the Iraqi government provided to the Iraqi people. And the ration was really extremely meager. So malnourishment became widespread and you, can, you could see it really in people's appearances. Um, so this is one of the impact of, uh, of the sanctions. Um, and also so that because of sanctions, it became much harder to have access to medicine um, and really the medical system collapsed. So hospitals in Iraq used to be like hospitals in the United States or Britain, and they were all public hospitals. And in the 19s, they were completely uh, destroyed and uh, and one of the things that Sima mentioned which also happened to Iraq is that people who are struggling with cancer couldn't have a treatment so the the death rate really increased because of that and one of the other thing that the sanctions uh, did is that it really promoted uh, profiteering and bribes so for example uh, teachers stopped uh, teaching uh, during the school year so that they can tutor students privately in order to make more money. Uh, so this way, when I say that the, also the sanctions led to the collapse of the educational system in, um, in Iraq. And one of the scene you began to see in Iraq that you've never seen before was the phenomenon of children begging in streets at traffic lights all the time. Like you would have at every traffic light, two, three, four children. And this is a scene was never seen before in Iraq. So children had to start dropping from schools in order to support um, their families. Um, and one of the other things that really had a huge impact uh, in Iraq was that women's position began to be deteriorated because of the sanctions. So women uh, uh, salaries, women always worked in Iraq, women's salaries became nothing. So they no longer could uh, afford helping their family. And for example, a, a, a doctor would have a man tell her if she quit her job, he would pay her double her salary and he would take her as, as a second wife. So you really see women's 
the gain in terms of employment uh, and uh, and education deteriorate after uh, this, after the sanctions began. And also one other thing about the sanction is that daily life became much more harder because for example, the flour that the government distributed was not good. So you couldn't buy uh, bread anymore from the from the bakeries. You had to make your own bread. Some of the food, for example, pasta or dried fruit, like broad beans that the government distributed were rotten. So people had like to take the worms out of the, out of the rotten side of the broad bean and then cook the rest. So really even pr like preparation for food became such a daily struggle that, uh, um, that people had to put up with. And the final thing that I wanted to mention is that a lot of women had to find other uh, jobs in order to make ends meet. So women began to tutor children, began to sew uh, 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 clothes uh, for, for their neighbors in order to make ends meet. So the, the sanctions, as I said, really impacted Iraqis, especially middle class and poor Iraqis, and really led to the enrichment of people in power. Thank you so much, Zainab. Nikki will ask the next question. Thank you for giving us such a rich uh, and very brief uh, summary of the horrible situation that the sanctions caused in Iraq. Yes, thank you, Zainab. It's really heartbreaking to hear about all those devastating impacts. And um, now I wanna turn to talk about sanctions in Iran. And my first question is for uh, Negar. Negar, since you as a journalist have been covering sanctions, for about a decade now. Um, I wanted to ask if you could please provide us with some background on how long the sanctions have been in place, what effects they've had on ordinary people. And I also wanted to ask you about the Iranian government. Um, have the sanctions changed the Iranian state's policies, whether that be foreign policies, domestic policies? And if so, in what ways have sanctions changed their behavior? And if not, why, why not? Sure, thank you, Nikki, for the introduction to Sima and everyone else for hosting this very timely event. Um, as Iranians are still dealing with a broad range of economic sanctions under a pandemic. Um, so just take you back to about four decades ago, sanctions on Iran by the United States started after the hostage crisis, basically as a, as a punishment. Uh, for the overtake of the U.S. Embassy and the hostage taking. And over the decades, under almost every administration, sanctions have just been piling on on the Iranian economy, on various sectors of the Iranian economy. At some point, it used to be the nuclear program, then it expanded to Iran's oil sector, which is the most important industry in Iran, and, and then just expanding to other transportation, shipping, finance, and international, basically banking sanctions, um, and right now, as a result of four years of maximum pressure under the Trump administration, which hasn't ended basically because Joe Biden has not changed the policy of the Trump administration, there's a broad range of economic sanctions on almost every major industry in Iran. And as far as sanctions impacting the Iranian economy, Yes, it has, they've, they've had a tremendous impact on the Iranian economy. The oil sales of the country and the overall GDP has, has been shrinking uh, so much. There have been segments of the Iranian society, middle classes, lower middle classes that have been pushed down. Basically, a, a chunk of the Iranian middle class has disappeared, pushed into poverty as a result of this economic pressure. And then there's also this issue of mismanagement and corruption in the country, which is the making of the Iranian state that gets um, even worse in an ecosystem created by sanctions. Because if you're banning the country from basically any um, imports and exports, any major banking and financial system, essentially you're creating a, an ecosystem that lacks transparency, that breeds corruption. You have non-state actors basically selling Iranian oil, large sums of money is being transferred around um, that the state has to rely on to go around these sanctions. And uh, it's, it's also been this impact that what we call sanctions profiteers or Qasibana Tahrim, they're part, part of the Iranian, not every single person, but 
part of the Iranian political class, either within the state or some even by extension, benefit from sanctions. They welcome sanctions. They welcome this uh, tension, political tension with the West, um, which results in adding of more sanctions. And over the past four decades, as far as impact, we haven't really seen any major policy shift as a result of sanctions, not on Iran's nuclear program, not on Iran's domestic policies as far as repression, uh, closing of the political space, um, you know, cracking down on any form of dissent. The past four years of maximum pressure under President Trump, it was called maximum pressure and it really was maximum pressure. But during these years, and I'm not saying as a direct result of that, but during these years, there's, there was also maximum repression on the Iranian public. So when it comes to the domestic uh, scene from the viewpoint of the civil society, from the viewpoint of Iranian citizens, there has been this double maximum pressure from the US, from this international sanctions regime, and then also from their own state and their own government. And these go hand in hand and they just uh, sort of reinforce each other. Sanctions have impacted Iran's medicine market, medical devices, certain, not all, but certain life-saving medicine. There have been uh, reports from Human Rights Watch, from the Wilson Center and other uh, respected organizations detailing how uh, while medicine and humanitarian items are supposed to be exempt by sanctions on, on paper, but in reality, the banking and financial atmosphere has prevented any form of trade, uh, even when it comes to uh, medicine and medical devices. It's impacted Iran's technology sector, impacted Iran's entrepreneurs, social enterprise, just young, independent, non-state civilians, part of the civil society who want to strive in a country that has this a uh, crushing economy, not exactly as, as grim as Zaina was explaining about Iraq yet, but in essence, its, it's sanctions have helped uh, make a certain part of the political elite even richer and more powerful and more repressive and has just put um, this pressure on the public, on the civil society, on um, the, the more vulnerable parts of the population, women head of households, working class, the sick, people with um, serious diseases. And um, it just hasn't been, and as far as Iran's foreign policy, Iran's regional policy, there's all this talk of Iran's uh, support for terrorism, Iran's regional presence. We haven't seen any of that also changing or shifting as a result of sanctions. So there seems to be the sanctions for sanctions policy or sanctions for crushing the economy policy, which the Trump administration actually publicly boasted about. Secretary Pompeo talked about Iran, uh, you know, trying to feed its people. They have to change policy if they want to feed their own people, but we haven't really seen that kind of policy. It's a feel good, um, you know, posturing that you see very bipartisan in US Congress, whenever you introduce something as far as putting sanctions on Iran, you have the support of both parties. But as far as real changes on the ground, we haven't seen um, any form of positive change. In fact, it's mostly been reported as negative. Thank you for that very thorough answer and for clarifying um, some of the issues that come up a lot, like aren't medicines and medical equipment exempt because that's an objection we always hear. And as you mentioned, uh, the various other sanctions prevent the financial institutions from, from dealing in medicine and medical equipment and, and everything else. Um, I'm gonna quickly turn over to Seema again so she can keep us rolling along. Yes, and um, thank you, Nagar, for uh, that um, answer and for actually uh, also drawing uh, uh, our attention to uh, how Iran is not yet where Iraq was, uh, uh, you know, after many years uh, of sanctions, but um, Iran is definitely moving to that direction and we see so many similarities and um, our hope is that, uh, you know, like we said in the title of this event, that we learn from uh, past lessons. Uh, Nora, the next question is for you. Um, as a scholar who is uh, very well versed in international law, you have been quite vocal about the embargoes on Gaza. 
Could you talk about how the embargo has affected the Palestinian people and how are these embargoes on Gaza different from the sanctions on Iraq, Syria, or Iran? And um, how can we make sense of the embargoes and sanctions in the context of US imperialism and the US geopolitical interests in the region? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Seema. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you to these esteemed panelists. When they say, well, we couldn't find a woman to be on a panel. <laughs> like, really? We couldn't limit it. Um, and so I also just want to start by saying it, it's also really emotional, right? There's so much. This is devastating. We're talking about it on the policy level. We're critiquing U.S. empire. We're, we're talking about, you know, just devastation, what Rashid Kharadi, historian Rashid Kharadi has described as just unrelenting penetration and intervention into the Middle East because of its natural and geopolitical resource that it offers. And yet on this very human scale, as, as your artists have helped evoke, as the panelists have, have demonstrated, this is just devastation. There's no way around it, right? So how can one think, you know, how can one think, well, then how are sanctions not only regulated, right? But they're 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 held up and propped up as the optimal humanitarian option relative to war, right? As if there was a distinction, yet what, what's being described is warfare. Right, warfare with other forms of weapons, warfare that has been, you know, draped in a liberal veneer. So I want to answer your question about what international law has to say about this. Comment on, you know, some of the statistics, and then think about what it means politically. So just on on the on the legal question and of itself. So I start by telling you that sanctions are regulated in international law, are seen as an alternative, are you know part of um, Title. I'm sorry, Chapter Six. UN um, authority in how to apply some coercive pressure short of warfare, right? So there's this idea that you can, they're supposed to be targeted, they can be smart, you know, you don't target dual use items versus war. Now war is all encompassing. The, the, the sphere of what gets regulated and how human life gets protected shrinks. If you think about it in concentric circles, this is the realm of peacetime, this is the realm of wartime. Right, and so even what becomes permissible shrinks. Embargoes, blockades, siege is warfare. It is total, it is complete. There is a declaration of war as opposed to sanctions which are seen as short of war. And this is what we've been seeing in Gaza since 2006. Now the Gaza Strip, 365 square um, kilometers, um, understand that it is tiny. It is incredibly tiny. It is besieged, there is a land Siege, there is a naval blockade. There are now 2 million Palestinians trapped therein, three fourths of whom are refugees who are already in a precarious situation and have been food dependent. In addition to the imposition of this land siege and naval blockade has been systematic large scale offensive wars using high, you know, mass weapons technologies that are only available to technologically superior belligerents. I can't describe to you a more surreal violent situation and yet the discussion <laughs> is one that, that, that we don't even we don't even get to, to the necropolitical regime that has limited life for for Palestinians right that has been in the explicit terms of what Israeli officials have said which is we will put Palestinians on a diet of less than 2,000 calories per day you need 2,500 calories to be sustained. So at 2,000 calories, you're just above starvation. This is official policy. It's not something that they're unearthing. What has that meant um, in terms of the devastation yield? Look, there's there's ways, that, and why I keep describing this as necropolitical, because this isn't just about what is being demanded of the government, right? So Israel will say, well, we impose the regime, we'll, and we'll impose the blockade, we'll lift the blockade when Hamas does what we want. What Israel is demanding, number one, is a moving target. So even in the course of its warfares, it says we would want to expand the buffer zone. The next time we want to diminish um, Hamas's capacity to engage in, in you know, militant activity. But really what's, what's here is demanding the surrender of Palestinians. They would have to surrender that they are Palestinian. They could be Arab, they could be nomads, they can be you know, random refugees, but they are not an indigenous people with a right to the land and a right to return. That is what's being demanded. And so the violence is to askew that demand 
um, or, or, or to make that demand possible. So the, all of all of this regime targets their their lives. Um, Forty nine percent of the population, and uh, as of late twenty twenty, are unemployed. During the wars, there was a deliberate uh, deliberate policy of attacking agricultural fields. The Israeli language for attacking the fields is that they want to um, take out any kind of launching, uh, military launching pad for Hamas militants. And yet what they're really doing is limiting the capacity of Palestinians to survive and to even have the capacity um, to ever resist. I think uh, one of the most devastating things is really uh, when it comes to cancer um, and cancer treatment. Right now, we know um, that in Gaza, as of 2018, 39% of the population has been diagnosed. That's an, that's an absurd, an absurd level. And they cannot get treatment. They cannot get treatment. Um, of 18 million cases, 10 million have, re have resulted in, in deaths. And that's, these are preventable deaths. This is because they can't get permits to exit. Excuse me, when I say 39%, I meant that they can't get travel permits to treat their cancer. It's 18 million who have been diagnosed, but 39% can't get travel permits to travel. The reason that they can't be treated within Gaza is because medicine is limited to them on purpose. The only electric power plant was targeted in 2014 so that you can't even store medicines or run hospitals. Now consider that in the irony of the fact that Israel is now going to extract natural gas from Gaza's Mediterranean shore and sell it back. To Palestinians. So this isn't about right diminishing Hamas's capacity. This is really about control um, and surrender. I'll just share one more because uh, Zainab did this, and this is really important as well. The impact on women is devastating. Um, they, there's usually after breast uh, cancer treatment uh, uh, something like an 80% survival rate after five years after the diagnosis. Well, for Palestinian women in Gaza, that drops to 65%. So we can go through the numbers. I, I I do it, but I also cringe when I do it because it it takes these this devastation and makes it into statistics that you just can't capture uh, what's being done in the name of security. That you know, as you said, and I, I've gone on too long, so I'm going to wait till the next round to address you know the liberal veneer um, that that masks and shrouds this violence. Thank you so much, Nora. And I think, you know, it's so important to draw parallels and not just parallels, but connections between what's happening in Palestine, what's happening in Iran, what's happening in um, Iraq, Syria, and think about also the uh, both settler colonialism and the US geopolitical interests in, in the region. Thank you. Nikki, I think, uh, is going to ask the next question from Asal. Yes, and, and also I wanted to thank Nora for making these connections and, and bringing us back to the, you, you made the legal distinctions for us, which is always blurry, even you know for me, but to, to see these parallels that we're talking about basic survival, the illness, the preventable deaths is just, it's, it's heartbreaking to hear the statistics and then think about the individual. So, so thank you, Nora. And I'm gonna turn again to Iran, um, to ask Asad because she works on US policy toward Iran and she her work focuses on sanctions and its effect on Iranian people as well. But specifically, I wanted to talk about the JCPOA, which is uh, popularly known as the Iran deal or the Iran nuclear deal. If you could tell us about it, about its reversal under Trump and also about the Biden administration's approach to the JCPOA, to the sanctions and um, to ask you if you think that Biden has delivered his promises about his position in relation to the JCPOA. Well, first, let me say thank you for inviting me to be part of this incredible panel. Like all of the other panelists, I'm just very appreciative of organizing something like this. Um, so this is a little bit of a shift from the conversation. Obviously, so far, we've been talking about sanctions specifically and their impact. But it's interesting to bring the JCPOA into it because that tells us sort of why do we have these sanctions on Iran currently, or at least what is the US uh, policy and why do they say that we have these sanctions in place? And it goes back to the JCPOA. And basically the JCPOA was supposed to be, or is I should say, a nuclear issue agreement, right? It's about nuclear proliferation. And in this case, it's about non-proliferation, which is our goal, right? The goal of human society is to make sure that we are protected from an existential threat, which is nuclear proliferation. 
right? There's no question to this fact that there is a uh, for since you know the end of World War II and the first use of a nuclear weapon, which has only been used by the United States, the sheer devastation of that weapon has been a fear that exists amongst all of humanity. Because really, if you have a situation where you have a nuclear war, their borders don't matter at this point, right? So that is what this deal was about. And it's so important to bring that up. And it's so important to really emphasize that point because so often other issues become conflated with what this deal was about. And that's what we see happening constantly in the political discourse. It becomes about, you know, you hear people, opponents of diplomacy with Iran say things like, well, you can't trust Iran. You can't trust the Iranians. The Iranians won't negotiate with the US. The Iranians want to abide by a deal. This has been a repeated discourse, a repeated point. But now the fascinating part of this moment, that when we're talking in 2021, is that we have the history of the last six years to look back on, which flies in the face of all of that. Iran did sit and negotiate with the United States and the international community. Something to emphasize, this is not an agreement between the US and Iran. This is an international agreement. Iran did abide by the deal. And in fact, Iran abided by the deal and is still within the deal that the United States quit in 2018 under Donald Trump and that the United States violated. And Iran continued to abide by every part of the agreement for a full year after the United States left the deal and violated it. Now, if the US had violated the deal under Trump and decided to leave the other parties out of it, that would have been one thing, but that's not what happened. What the Trump administration really did is flex the full power of US hegemony on the economy. And the fact that no other entity, no other state, no other party was able to go around US sanctions because the US didn't just decide to sanction Iran, it decided to actually enforce sanctions on anybody who tried to violate US sanctions on Iran. That meant that nobody could do anything with Iran. And that's, that's the, the level to which the US has power, right? So often in these conversations when we're talking about you know, the US and Iran, it's as if you're talking about entities that have even remotely similar power. That's an absurd point. The United States is the most powerful country in the world um, with no argument. It is arguably the most powerful entity in human history. And we're comparing it to Iran, a state that does not have the power to do anything about US sanctions. That's the simplest sort of case to point out that if we're talking about states that are on equal footing, then Iran would be able to reciprocate, but it can't. It remains crushed under US sanctions. In fact, the power of the US, like I just said, is exemplified in the fact that no one can do anything about US sanctions, even massive economies like China, even Europe, nobody could do anything about it. And that's really what the Trump administration sort of um, unveiled, right? Whereas maybe in the past, the US didn't um, so overtly use its power as a hammer that said, we will do this and it doesn't matter who objects. The Trump administration lifted that veil and showed the full extent of US power. and. You know, when you when you look at the nuclear agreement, when we talk about, you know, President Biden as a candidate promised to return to the deal, right? All the candidates were asked, the Democratic candidates were asked, are you going to return to the deal? Vast majority said yes. Biden's hand went up saying yes, he's going to return to the deal. Biden spent four years at, under the Trump administration criticizing Trump's Iran policy, not just President Biden, but also Secretary of State Blinken. Uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, all had spent the entire Trump administration criticizing that very policy because they said one specific thing, the deal was working. These aren't my words. These are the words of President Biden. The deal was working. And if the deal was working, then it was Trump that walked away from the deal, not the Iranians. These are, again, the words of President Biden. So to your question of now that we have a new administration, where do we stand? We're about two months into a new administration. And there can be all sorts of sort of politicizing questions of, well, you know, it, there are signals from this administration that they want to return to the deal, that they want to return to diplomacy. But in practice, the maximum pressure policy has continued in practice. And what that means is no sanctions have been lifted. And something I want to point out that's a key in that and what's so problematic about it is in April of 2020, so last year, President Biden at the time was not the president, of course, but wrote um, a statement. It's on Medium. You can Google it. He wrote it himself, or at least it's in his name. It's a statement on sanctions relief for Iran. In that statement, and this is, by the way, to the criticisms that say, oh, well, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian goods are exempt. Biden himself recognizes that they are exempt, but acknowledges that the way that the sanctions regime is set up currently actually prevents 
foods and medicines and essential goods from getting to Iran. These are his words. So it's a clear acknowledgement of the fact that yes, on paper they're exempt, but in practice, these goods are being, uh, they are prevented from actual transactions that Iran can import. And what Biden called for, this is now almost a full year ago, 11 months ago, was immediate steps that Trump should take to relieve those sanctions, to make sure why, because of the pandemic, because we are in a global pandemic. And for, because it is humane and because it is right, these are all words from President Biden, that sanctions, those sanctions should be addressed. And unfortunately, two months in, we don't have any of those sanctions addressed. And though there are, again, there are signals, right? The Biden administration at the beginning said that they are going to review COVID related sanctions. But as they take the time to review these sanctions, people are still suffering under a pandemic. And, you know, it really begs the question of, was it a, a slogan because in fact, returning to the deal negotiations with Iran, resolving the nuclear issue with Iran is a bipartisan, widely popular sentiment amongst American voters. Politicians different, American voters. Amongst Biden supporters, 84% have been polled to say that they support negotiations with Iran. Amongst Trump voters, 54% in the same poll said that they support negotiations with Iran. So, you know, we talk about unity, we talk about bipartisan, we talk about issues that relate to what actual Americans want. The American people want this issue resolved. They want it resolved without a conflict. And very often they don't support um, policies that actually starve people, especially in a pandemic. So to answer your question, no, we haven't seen a, a significant or substantial step be taken by the Biden administration to address sanctions or to address really returning to the deal. Thank you, Asal. And uh, I think so far you're the first person to say the P word, the pandemic, which applies to all the situations that we've had so far from Gaza and, and the, the, the situation everywhere. And um, it also helps to be reminded of candidate Biden's words and uh, compare to where the speed at which things are moving forward, if, if they are moving forward. As you said, there are signals, but there, there seems to be a lot of loud voices that want to pile on additional demands on uh, on the JC returning to the JCPOA. So it's very helpful to have your clarification on what that was and what it included. Uh, I think we're now ready to jump into a round two of questions. Uh, and I am the person who's going to start the second round as uh, so I will continue talking and uh, ask Zainab if she could uh, talk to us about the Iraqi diaspora. Many of us here in this room, uh, Iranians are Iranian diaspora, and we remember what happened to Iraq. Your, your book grapples with the Iraqi diaspora's role in the politics of the, of the homeland, and that is not always a, a happy story. And so I was wondering if you could talk about the complex politics around uh, the role of the Iraqi diaspora in the US and what, what that role was in Iraq uh, regime change and the consequences of that. Yeah, um, so one thing I, uh, I would like just to like quickly say, um, there was really a grassroots uh, movement uh, in London among Iraqis to help Iraqis in Iraq. So they were having fund uh, uh, raising events to send food, to send especially medical supplies uh, to Iraq. So there were some Iraqis who were trying to do that. Um, but uh, London was also in the 90s, the home of the Iraqi opposition to the United States. And um, um, some of them were really in close, uh, uh, they were in touch with the, with the United States administration. I think we all have heard about um, Ahmed Chalabi and Ayad Alawi. Um, and they were really uh, working to agitate for the invasion of Iraq. Um, so there were some Iraqi oppositional groups that were very inclusive, uh, anti-war and anti-sanctions, but the United States didn't open any channels of communication with them, even though they tried. They tried to talk to the United States administration and say the war is not going to help the situation, it's going to aggravate the situation. But the United States didn't listen to them, but listened to people who were really espousing a sectarian discourse uh, that were saying the um, the political structure of the country um, in Iraq after Saddam Hussein should be reorganized according uh, sectarian representation. 
uh, and they were also the ones who agitated for the invasion of Iraq. And of course, the United States listened to that. And then we have, uh, so, so there was really, to me, there was a convergence between a sectarian discourse on part of the uh, opposition and an orientalist and democratization discourse on the part of the United States administrations. Um, so, so at the end of the day, the United States invaded uh, Iraq and we saw what happened. And really to understand why the occupation went so wrong, uh, is really to appreciate the impact of the sanctions on, on Iraq, that by the time the United States had, inv had invaded Iraq, the social fabric in Iraq had completely collapsed uh, because of the sanctions. Um, so, so really the sanctions had uh, far-reaching uh, repercussions that, that people don't like to think about. They just think, oh, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Uh, what, uh, the U.S. blundered in 2003. But in fact, the U.S. has been involved in Iraq since, like, I would say, even the 80s, 60s. And the sanctions was the latest manifestations that completely destroyed uh, the country. And uh, the opposition, unfortunately, the opposition in diaspora, especially in London, uh, played a huge role in advocating um for the um for the occupation and to bring another war upon the country that has been struggling under the under the sanctions thank you zaina uh i think in this regard too we see uh very unfortunate parallels with i'm sorry you're still i'm sorry i'm done sorry oh you're done okay um I was just going to say that, unfortunately, in this regard, too, we see parallels with the Iranian case and the Iranian diaspora and the issues of whose voice gets heard, who gets to go have their picture taken with the Secretary of State and who doesn't, uh, and how that impacts policies. And I know that Simo wants to ask about that, so I'm just going to turn the mic over to her. Yes, thank you, Zainab. I, um, uh, you know, I, I've read your book, and um, I, as I was reading it, um, there are so many parallels between uh, Iraqi diaspora and Iranian diaspora. is uncanny, and to um, see that again, you know, some of um, the the ways that Iranian diaspora is doing things that some of the Iraqi um, uh, the diaspora did, and unfortunately, you know, we see uh, what ended happening in uh, Iraq. So, um, thank you for uh, for your contribution, Nigar. Uh, connected to the question that we asked Zainab is the role of the Iranian diaspora. Can you talk about how? Um, factions among the Iranian diaspora might be supporting the sanctions on Iran for their political agendas, or perhaps because they believe that that is the best thing for Iran. Um, and on the other side of the coin are some segments of the Iranian diaspora who reject Iranian uh, you know, any kind of repression by the Iranian state and only focus on US sanctions. Um, can you talk about this false dichotomy where any in-between position is accused of either being um, a lackey um, uh, uh, for the Iranian state or for the US government? So there is no possibility of neither um, being this or that. Can you talk about that in-between position and the difficulty of doing this kind of work that you're doing uh, in this kind of environment? Sure, thank you so much. And that's a great question. And at the risk of generalizing the diaspora too much, because there's also so many um, different shades of how the diaspora views Iran and is involved in political work or is actually not. But like you're saying, there are two major camps um, that are the, the camp that supports sanctions, supported maximum pressure. Um, we thankfully don't hear very loud and public calls for war and invasion in Iran. Even the top leaders of the most hardline factions of the diaspora, um, they might talk about it in, in closed door settings, but they don't talk about it in public because it's definitely not something that the Iranian uh, society supports. Iranians still have the memories of the eight-year war with Iraq, and um, it's something, they're still part of the country that have been destroyed by that war and not rebuilt yet, and it's definitely not something that there's an appetite for in Iran. Iranians also look to their east uh, 
see Afghanistan, look to their west, see Iraq, and it's not something they aspire to. So we don't hear that call for war like we, we heard in some part of the Iraqi diaspora community, but we definitely hear very strong voices for sanctions. Now, as far as sanctions, there are designations, there are political sanctions, or as the human rights, part of the human rights community calls human rights sanctions. For example, you designate a judge who is seen as a human rights abuser. You designate an IRGC interrogator. You designate so-and-so senior officials. You block their assets, you ban their travel. There's that, but then there's also broad economic sanctions. So part of the community supports the political sanctions the more human rights designations, but part of the uh, more hardcore diaspora or exile community, I should say, uh, definitely supports economic sanctions, which is not something that has a lot of support in uh, inside Iran among the society. You don't hear a big majority of Iranians coming out saying, yes, these sanctions are great, keep sanctioning us. We hear the, the main talking point from Iran is that these sanctions may not be our biggest problem. Our biggest problem is the repressive government, is the corruption, is the mismanagement of funds in the country. There was actually recently a poll that uh, listed sanctions as the second problem in the economy. But you hear this very vocal support from a small minority of the diaspora, but with a very loud voice, with access to lots of media with access to um, hallways of power that support sanctions. There's also a, uh, the opposite group, and we belong to none, um, that only sees sanctions as, as problems of Iran. We talked about the impact of sanctions on medicine. It's part of the market of medicine, not all of it. Sanctions on technology, on entrepreneurship, but it's just basically the mother of all problems. And this is also in line with the, with the talking point coming from the Iranian government. And I want to bring this back also to the, to the two governments because part of these opposition and exile communities are not also very independent. It's, there, there are connections with, uh, with governments. You hear these um, very strong talking points or at, at some point eventually propaganda from both sides that blame the entire situation and the problem on the other side. Nonstop television coverage in Iranian state media of the killing of Khashoggi while they justify their own brutality against Iranian protesters. It's just something that makes Iranians very angry and very furious. Nonstop coverage of the humanitarian impact of sanctions, but no mention of the brutality of the Iranian state. And on the um, part of the of the U.S. administration, and this is something that just became very uh, visible under the Trump era, just downplaying any uh, humanitarian impact of sanctions, while also boasting about the the crushing of the Iranian economy and just trying to blame um, everything, um, especially in their direct contact with the with the Iranian public, blame all of the problems on. On Iranian states, mismanagement, corruption, and also repression, focusing uh, on that. But I really see this as a two-sided problem, and both sides are very much responsible, as I was talking about, the enormity and the power of the U.S. government as an entity, and then also the Iranian state, who has full control over the lives, the economy, and the entire um, livelihood of the Iranian population. So I see these two problems go hand in hand. Unfortunately, two small minorities in the diaspora um, only see one side of the problem. But when I speak to ordinary Iranians, both on the ground and also people who live in the diaspora and don't have that outsized voice or access to the big megaphones, they actually see both problems because Iranians, especially Iranian Americans, have seen the impact of the Trump travel ban on their own families. They've seen the impact of sanctions. If you're an Iranian student in the US, in Canada, in Europe, you may have had your bank account closed at some point because only because you're of an Iranian nationality without having any ties to the regime, to the political structure. So it's something that Iranians feel, you know, within their own personal life, or at least by one or two degrees of separation with people around him. So I would say there's more of an um, understanding of the big picture, but there's also these vocal um, voices on both sides. And then also, of course, inside Iran who want to only highlight one side of the problem.
Thank you so much, um, Negarjan, for uh, that uh, very comprehensive response. Um, I'm hoping that some of our fellow Iranian um, diasporic people are listening to this uh, and actually thinking about uh, what you just told us that basically uh, adds nuance to the kind of approach that we can have to both the sanctions regimes and also the Iranian state's repression. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Nagar. And as a media professor, I, I particularly appreciate the attention you brought to the fact that the Iranian state has a monopoly over the broadcasting, so they can focus and uh, shape the narrative in one particular way. But then on the diaspora side, the uh, media outlets here are also either funded by interested parties or give voice to only particular sides. And so those of us who want to have a critical view of both sides tend to get lost uh, in the middle. So, so thank you. I have a question now for Noura. It's a question that's come up in the uh, chat a couple of times already. And it is one of the uh, challenges that we face in the anti-sanctions movement. And, and that is that folks who are against sanctions uh, on Iran, but they also support the Palestinian people's call for BDS, um, they're always, uh, they're often, I shouldn't say always, accused of having a double standard. And that double standard is, hey, if you're asking for divestment and boycott of Israel, then you should also support sanctions on Iran because as we heard from Negar and others, Iran is also a human rights violator. Iran also um, does many problematic things in the region. So what's the difference there? And how, how, how are um, people who have this position not hypocrites for being pro-sanctions in one case and, and, and not the other? Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Nikki. I saw it come up multiple times in the chat as well. Um, before I address the question specifically, I just want to make a few corrections since this is recorded. I was not reading, and so my stats uh, were confused. Number one, um, the, the 18 million figure is a global figure and not specific to Gaza. Uh, number two, it's chapter seven authority, not chapter six authority, and where you can um, apply sanctions. And then the third thing on the 39%, I think I already addressed that. So what about this question, right? I, I Here's my position, which is that my opposition to sanctions it's not is not necessarily in principle, right? So I'm not opposed to all warfare. I'm not a pacifist in my opposition to the war on Iraq. Right. There are there are that's just where I'm at now. Maybe I'll become a pacifist, but I have not gotten there. And in the same way, my position on sanctions is not one based on principle, but ways, but one where politics guides me to, you know, the outcome of when I think it should be applied. Um, and so there are a few things. One is, you know, one is general. I can give you a general outline of how to do this practice yourself. And the other one is specific to Palestinians on the general realm. I would start with the basic tenet of do no harm. Right. And in the case that we're discussing right now, there is harm that is being done rather than rectified. And so here the sanctions actually removes the harm, then creates the harm. So that that should be something that guides us. So in the same way that the call for sanctions on Israel is one that's intended to remove harm that has been done to people, but that is facilitated through the provision of unequivocal military, financial, um, and, and diplomatic support from global empire, right? So that, that means a great deal. It's not that it's, it's in the absence of doing nothing, there is structural violence that is still being committed where the principle of sanctions is to address that structural violence not to create a new level. So that's that's one thing that guides me, which leads to the second, which is about power and accountability. There are levers of power here that are at stake that we should not remove as we consider the imposition of sanctions, right? Um, and, and so what does that power look like? And what is it masking? Where are sanctions normally applied? And here we have, again, because of a concentration of that power within the UN Security Council and the five permanent members with uh, veto uh, power, that those sanctions are, are not necessarily ever applied against the most powerful states. So that the harms they commit, ones that are 
far more tremendous than we can, you know, measure in in, in distinct accounts, right? Are never held to uh, are never held to account. Even now, in discussions on the International Criminal Court, this keeps coming up for me, because if you think about the International Criminal Court, you can't you can't prosecute any countries for slavery or colonialism, right? So how is power, you know, cooked in? to the sanctions uh, regime already. And so here, this is also about accountability and the lack of accountability and impunity that's been provided, which brings us to the third uh, guiding principle that I would urge folks to consider, which is, as you said, Nikki, this is a call from Palestinians, right? It's Palestinians who are asking for a particular kind of sanctions to rectify the harm that European states and third party states are already imposing. There are no, there's not a similar call from Iraqis in the 1990s to impose sanctions upon them or from Iranians to impose sanctions upon them, right? There's not a similar call. There was a similar call from South Africans who said impose sanctions on this racist regime. We need you to be part of the solution because doing nothing, you're part of the problem. So that dimension of the fact that it's a people driven is one that is constantly, uh, I don't think forgotten. I think that it's constantly obscured on purpose, right? In order to basically make some red herring claim about, about the hypocrisy of those who are calling for sanctions on, Iraq, uh, on, on Israel. Um, so then what about specific to Palestinians? I'll just say a few things. Number one, the call for sanctions from Palestinians comes after decades of trying other forms of resistance that have been squashed, criminalized, and made unavailable. From legal remedies to diplomatic remedies, political remedies, military remedies that have been squashed, sanctions now remains one of the few measures available to Palestinians to ask for solidarity um, to, 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 to uh, rectify this harm. Um, and then second, to think about the, the sanctions that are being called upon Israel are not sanctions to starve people, to deny them electricity, to prevent them from having access to medical care or to devastate the economy. There's specific sanctions on the transfer of military weapons that have already been deemed illegal. They're on, you know, do not, do not transfer um, um, F-47s. Do not transfer cluster munitions. These are the weapon sanctions that are being imposed. And in, in terms of boycott, that's a consumer right? That's a consumer activity that's completely distinct from sanctions, as is divestment, right? So I think that the collapse of the, even though on the face of it, it seems like the most obvious parallel to make, um, scratching the surface even a little bit reveals how, frankly, incomparable uh, these cases are, which is not a problem, but, you know, one of the things to illuminate is we really shouldn't shy away from having politics guide our answers. You know, just having a principled stance might lead us to a dead end, um, as we've seen in the debate on free speech in the United States. And so it's, I, do not be ashamed of having a politics here that guides you in a politics that grapples directly with power. Thank you, Nora. Thank you for those distinctions, especially since for the most part, we've been talking about parallels, but the distinctions are really important. And I appreciate you being so thorough, considering that as you sort of pointed to, sometimes these, um, uh, questions are not really asked in good faith. It's, they're sort of derailing uh, the, the conversation, but I think you provided us with a number of guiding principles that'll be very useful. And um, you said the other P word, which is power, which we, we haven't talked about either, the sort of unequal power relations. Uh, and that makes a big difference in understanding these differences. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to uh, Sima. Yes, thank you, Nora. I think what you said is really important to think about. Uh, this is something that SL also mentioned that we can't think about as if we have two countries on equal levels of power. We are talking about an empire and we are talking about basically uh, uh, a state that has been since the Iranian revolution constantly under attack, basically uh, been put under this category of uh, access of evil since September 11. And so we are talking about an empire and the sanctions that the empire basically is uh, imposing, not just on Iran, but on several um, countries. And we are talking about the settler colonial states um, as opposed to the Palestinian people 
who basically, you know, we can't really talk about a dialogue um, or, you know, think about the Israeli tanks and the demolition to uh, the, uh, you know, Palestinian children's slingshot and think of those as um, equal uh, in terms of um, the way that we think that all Palestinians did this too. So uh, thank you for bringing that up because uh, it's impossible to have this conversation unless we actually pay attention to gross inequalities of power uh, that exist because of settler colonialism, because of histories of imperialism and colonialism. Um, Asanjan, and the last question is for you uh, in the second round. Can you talk about the connection between the US sanctions on Iran on, um, the sanctions on Iraq and the embargo on Gaza and the role of Israel and the US in decisions about policy towards Iran. How are Palestine, Iran and Iraq related? Um, and also, can you say how Iran's intervention and support of groups in Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq might have created nationals feelings that make connecting the struggles of people in these locations difficult? Uh, well, on the first part of the question, I think we've sort of just answered it, right? Um, what connects these issues is essentially US imperialism, right? Mm -hmm. To deny that fact is one of the most frustrating things of having a conversation with anybody about anything that has to do with these things. Because as soon as somebody points out, well, yes, Iran, for instance, the argument is, well, Iran is sanctioned because they abuse human rights and because we don't, you know, we believe in democracy. That's the US stance. These are values that we espouse. And those values are incredible, by the way. Because every time we have these conversations, it seems like if you say something that's critical of the United States, that makes you anti-American. I always say it's quite the opposite, right? It's the exact opposite of that. The reason we're critical of the United States as an American is because A, we believe in, in these values that we espouse and that we can actually strive to be those things, not just talk about being those things. And also because we have a responsibility. There is no way of removing ourselves as responsible people for, you know, I said it at the beginning, in the first question, I said, we are the most powerful country in the world. And so we can exact pressure, we can exact destruction on other people that they cannot reciprocate against us. And being in that position of power gives us a responsibility to understand as a populace how our policy should be carried out. And by the way, in a democracy, policies are carried out based on what the majority of the people want. Unfortunately, in our country, we don't do that. Like I just said, we have ending endless war has become a ubiquitous sort of soundbite that Republicans and Democratic candidates use, and yet we don't do it. So. We're not not doing it because that's not what the populace wants. We're not doing it for political reasons that has nothing to do with what actual Americans want. And so when you look at how these states are connected and how these policies are connected, they're connected because there is a status quo that maintains a certain power structure. And ultimately that's all we're trying to do. Every nation state acts in its own interest. When Iran acts in its own interest, we call them evil. When the United States acts in its own interest, it's totally fine. Except for the fact that when we act in what we call our own interest, it often leads to the devastation and destruction of other populations, of other countries. Not to mention, and this is fascinating, when we talk about human rights abuses, we don't talk about our own. Mm -hmm. As if we live in a utopic society that we can just ignore, for instance, mass protests that went across this country in all of the summer to address those very abuses that never get addressed. So. You know, it's great to espouse, espouse these values and they're very important values to have, but as long as we apply them selectively, which is what we do, then it cannot be taken seriously as a value. Instead, they become political talking points. It's great to talk about human rights, but when you ignore them in another case, is that your value or is this the political point that you're, is, is this sustaining some kind of status quo? Well, I'll give you a concrete example. On the same day that President Biden said, Iran can't act with impunity, Guess who did act with impunity? MBS of Saudi Arabia. This, the United States intelligence says that MBS approved the murder of a journalist, of an American, an American person. And even that becomes an argument, right? People will say things like, well, he's not really an American person. Does that negate the fact that he was chopped up into pieces in an embassy? No. But when you allow one state to act with impunity, and of course, Noura has spoke about, spoken articulately about the amount of impunity that Israel acts with, and you then use those same values against another state, it creates a sort of false dichotomy, right? It's not 
we're not really applying those values. And that doesn't mean that the Iranian state does not repress its own people. It doesn't mean that they don't commit human rights violations. It doesn't mean that they're a democratic state. It's none of those things, right? You can talk about those abuses. You can talk about those things and talk about the abuses of these other states. You know, in, um, in this conversation we just had, we were talking about Iraq. And then what happens is people will say things like, yes, but should we have left Saddam in power? Saddam was bad. Saddam was bad in the 1980s when we supported him. So there is a problem when every time we talk about these issues, we talk about them in this lens of whatever fits the moment or the, the thing that we're talking about while ignoring all of that history. The United States had no problem with Saddam Hussein in the 1980s when he invaded Iran, when he used chemical weapons against Iran, the international community was silent because as long as Iranians were the ones that were dying, it was fine. So as long as we approach these things within these systems of power politics, we can talk, you know, about values all we want. That's not what we're doing. And so those of us who are arguing the other side are saying, yes, these values are incredibly important. Let's abide by them. Let's apply them systematically across the board. Let's be even handed brokers. Because in fact, as the most powerful country in the world, we are in a position to do so. We are in a position to have an actual impact and to have a positive impact, but it'll only happen when we stop politicizing every point and we act on the values that we espouse. Um, in terms of the, the second question, and I know we're running out of time, and we're going to have questions, so I don't want to get into it too much, but, you know, this idea of sort of national identity, sometimes there's a discussion that as if we've transcended nation states, and that's, we're nowhere close to that, right? People still identify um, within their nation states. And the Iranian government sometimes has this idea that uh, they can export certain ideas from their own borders, and because of uh, the, the being Shiites, for instance, will, will make people um, sort of coalesce behind them. And of course, that's not how things work out because nation states, like I said earlier, are acting in their own interest. And one concrete example of that is the war in the 1980s. So um, despite the fact that Iraq is a majority Shiite country, Iraqis didn't fight on the Iranian side. Of course they didn't, they fought on their own side. There are Iranian Arabs, right, in the Ahwazi region they didn't fight on the Iraqi side, they fought on the Iranian side. And the reason is because they fall into these, they, we fall back into these sort of nation state categories because that's um, the most uh, prevalent sort of identity that people still uh, adhere to. And so I think there's a, a naivete on the part of not only Iran, but also the United States, when you think that if you go into countries and invade them, they're going to breach you happily. It's natural for all of these states to try to defend themselves. We can go into other questions then. <laughs> Thank you so much, Asanjan, for um, these uh, responses. And I know that these are really kind of broad questions and uh, we have very limited time, so we can't really get um, uh, in um, too much of detail. Uh, I'm gonna suggest since we are, um, at uh, 3.17 Central Time for 17 um, Eastern Standard Time, that we only take some like three minutes between all the panelists to maybe, um, if you guys wanna respond to something that uh, another person said and try to collectively wrap it up in three minutes and then get some questions from the audience. And just a note to the audience that uh, we are not taking questions in the chat, but in the Q and A, so please, if you, have questions. There are already so many questions, but uh, uh, please post them in the Q&A. So um, if you guys want to respond to each other, uh, please uh, take a couple of minutes to do that. I want to make a comment about what Asal said, and I think this is very important. And sadly, I hear it in some part of the diaspora, the exile community that and it's sometimes directed at people like Asal or even myself, that if you don't like the US or if you hate it so much, just go back and live in Iran. It's just such a wrong and dangerous comment. And it's something you would expect to hear. And we have actually heard it. That's what I'm saying. In Iranian state media, there was once this very conservative um, analyst on Iranian state media that said, if you don't like the, the way of living here, if you don't like forced hijab, if you don't like all these social rules, just leave Iran and go live somewhere else. And it's just sad that you see this being repeated in the diaspora community when as citizens, engaged citizens or journalists, analysts, civil society, activists, academics, you want to engage in the political space and you see that kind of 
um, anger uh, being directed at you, and sometimes from prominent voices in the in the diaspora. I'm not just talking about anonymous trolls on Twitter who always say that, but from prominent voices. I just feel like it's a very wrong understanding. I'm glad um, that Asa brought that up. Thank you. Yes, it's quite xenophobic. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Um, other people who want to take a minute or so. Comment uh, something, because some people mentioned the pandemic. <clears throat> so the sanctions don't happen in an ideal world. Uh, so that's why their impact becomes so compounded. So for example, what really, what made the sanctions on Iraq very devastating was the 1991 Gulf War and the complete destruction of the infrastructure during the bombing by the United States and its allies. So, so, the, so, so that's why when the sanction, Iraq was really reeling from a, a, a horrible devastation. And then the sanction came and compounded the situation. And right now to have the sanctions in Iraq and then have a pandemic, that really complicates things. And that the suffering of people will, will increase drastically. And I hope, I really hope that the Iranian people, the Iranian people will be able to have access uh, to the vaccine. Um, so, so sanctions always happen with a pandemic, with a war, and it becomes extremely devastating. So I just want to draw the audience attention to how compounded the situation is. Thank you, Zainab. That's a really important point. So if there are no other comments that uh, you guys have for each other, I think we should move to questions from the audience. Nikki, do you wanna ask the first question from the audience? Sure, there's a, there's a few of them that kind of fit in the same categories. I'm gonna lump them together and open it. Um, several people are asking about, uh, in the absence of something inhumane like sanctions, what are some other options for punishing or holding accountable uh, governments, leaders that uh, should be punished for various reasons. Uh, so that's one general question. And related to that question was, what about sanctions that, uh, let's say, freeze the assets of one particular individual or are otherwise targeted so that they can reduce uh, harm? Uh, what do folks think about that as an option and would that be effective without harming ordinary people? I'm, I'm happy to go first because I know that my, the first part of my answer is <laughs> not, listen, this is the way that I feel about punishment in general, right? Which is that oftentimes we conflate the idea of punishment with justice and those aren't the same thing, right? It could be vengeance, it could somehow satisfy, but there's nothing that's just that, that you know, that what they say is that the manifestation of justice is love. Right? The manifestation of justice is, is something other than what produced the harm in the first place. So I think about Muammar al-Qaddafi of Libya, devastated his people, right? Took his, you know, his own hubris and an idea of anti-colonial fervor to absolute megalomaniac levels um, and produced a tremendous amount of harm, was literally on the verge from what we understand about to um, launch a mass attack on the eastern you know, province of Libya which precipitates the intervention, sanctions, and then what happens to him is he's sodomized publicly with um, weapons, right? You know, and I under I you, I completely understand the the visceral nature of wanting that revenge, but how is that just? How is that now the outcome of what's being what's continuing to happen in Libya? A form of justice. It's th that's the same thing that I used to guide, for example, when I think about intervention anywhere. We tend to think about the short term and the lowest hanging fruit of what seems the most obvious as the thing that we should aspire to and want. Intervene, remove the head of state, for example, without taking into account that oftentimes the violence that will then follow that kind of intervention right, is much worse, produces much more instability than the conditions that preceded it, which is not to say to keep the regime in place, but to say that there must be other ways to produce justice besides these things, besides these forms of punishment and immediate um, change. And so that means that's the work that we're doing. That means, you know, that that's exactly the work that we're doing as we're challenging imperialism as a, as a legitimate system of, of economic exchange. It's not. 
So what do we produce in its alternative? That is justice. So I, that that's what I'll, I'll, I'll say there in terms of obviously folks want to know, yes, but what about, you know, reducing the harm? And I think that the second question goes to this. I do think that some forms that when we can identify how we are part of the problem and then thinking about how to remove that as part of the problem insofar as that constitutes targeted, targeted sanctions, fine. But I want to be very careful, right? So the United States provides, you know, all this money to Israel, all this money to Egypt, right? So part of, can we reduce that harm? Would that be acceptable? Yes, but distinguish that from how we've used targeted sanctions in this, you know, this esteemed panel has studied this. Targeted sanctions is a term of art. And oftentimes, right, it's actually obscuring that there are no targets, that this is actually blanket harm that's being done. So I wanna be very careful that we not confuse what the practice that we we're pursuing with the term of art um, that has been used in these places because there's nothing targeted about them. Thank you, Nora. Thank you for bringing up Libya as well because that's another example that's sometimes used for Iran uh, as a kind of bizarre consolation. Like, don't worry, Libya ha happened under uh, under the Democrats, so the Democrats might do the same for us even if Trump is gone. So believe it or not, that's a consolation that people offer one another. So I think uh, uh, Seema is gonna do a second question unless anybody else has a comment on the first question. I have a short comment about uh, Iran, Nikki, and again, going back to designations or an alternative to broad economic sanctions. I see from some of our um, friends and colleagues who are more in touch with the human rights community that um, they ask for these designations, naming and shaming in one part is one part of it when you designate a human rights abuser and, and then also blocking of assets if they do have any or travel ban. But it's also important that we look at the context. Is this country a U.S. or a Western ally or is it a foe? Do Iranian leaders, top Iranian leaders even care about being banned from travel to the US as opposed to US allies in the region. So for example, when we're talking about the case of Saudi Arabia, that's very different because Saudi Arabia, MBS, they want to be friends and allies of the US. He wants to be able to travel to the US. And it's also the form of punishment when people are asking activists, for example, anti-war activists, stop selling arms to Saudi Arabia, stop selling arms to the UAE so they can go and use it against the civi uh, civilians in Yemen, that's one ask. And then when you're talking about removing financial sanctions so that Iranians will be able to pay for the vaccine, so that Iranians will be able to import life-saving medicine, these are completely um, different, at least layers of punishment that we're talking about that sometimes get lumped into this big, oh, then why not this and why not that and, and become very wrong comparisons, I think. I also just wanted to add one comment. It's, it's interesting in these conversations because it's odd to me that we think about things, the, the framing of the conversation is what, what can we and who's we? I'm assuming we as the United States, right? What can we do to hold other people accountable? And why is the question ever, what can we do to be accountable to ourselves? Which is the first thing that we can do, our first line of defense. And I think Nora pointed to this when she said, you know, do no harm. Our first line of activism is addressing our own responsibility and our own accountability. Until we can do that, the idea that we can make somebody else be accountable um, to anything that they do seems, seems far-fetched. And of course, it falls into the, the, the issue of what is the actual intention behind these policies? Is the intention really to hold somebody accountable or is it to maintain a status quo of power? And if it's to maintain a status quo of power, then that's why we keep going in circles. We go in circles because we talk about one thing, we say a lot of things, but that's not actually what we're doing. And as long as we do that, we'll maintain these sort of hamster wheels that we're in. Thank you all. Um, and I think what you said, SL, is really important in terms of uh, not just, um, you know, thinking uh, do no harm, but um, also asking the question of why are we even thinking that the U.S. should be in the position to impose sanctions and how that question of even which sanctions are good, which ones are bad, reifies and naturalizes the national order of things in the way that the U.S. holds so much power and polices basically uh, and acts as the white savior. And of course, again, it has to do with the US geopolitics and history of uh, imperialism. So um, uh, I'm gonna suggest we are at uh, 3.29 my time. Um, 
if everyone is okay with staying for one more question uh, from the audience and caption max i hope this is okay with you too and if you're done captioning that's okay we'll we'll uh, just end up uh, not having the last five minutes uh caption but i hope that you can stay too um so i'm gonna read there are several questions and i'm gonna try to kind of bring them together there's one question that is written for um nora and uh, but I think it's a question that everyone can answer because it's also about sanctions and embargoes. And the question is that when we talk about sanctions and embargoes, we only focus on economics and power politics as if uh, it is separated from the daily lives of ordinary citizens. Um, can can you guys briefly comment on this separation, taking into consideration the fact that death is at the center of the politics uh, in places like Gaza, and I would say Iran and Iraq, uh, people are made available to death and injury, and where death becomes um, almost normalized, a normalized condition of life due to uh, the Israeli necropolitical regime or the US necropolitical um, policies. So that's one question. How can we think about populations such as um, uh, uh, Palestinian population, Iraqi population, Afghan population? Uh, I would say, you know, uh, Lebanese. Lebanon is doing really uh, bad right now. Uh, how can we think about those as populations that are made available to death and injury? Um, and the other question is basically if we can um, if you can, um, I, I don't know if we have time, but uh, making connections also, not parallels, but maybe connections to sanctions against Venezuela. Um, and uh, what is at stake uh, in Iran, Iraq, and Venezuela? Uh, are they similar or different? And what connects them together? So anyone who wants to take a stab at that. How about I just try to try to come in on the first one, which is about we talk about policies, but this is really about people and what happens when we center people. I, I honestly think that that's what this panel did really beautifully. It was overwhelming, um, and it was part of I think you, you know um, the feminist work of of centering the source of life. Um, in these discussions. And so I think that that is at the heart of it. It was part of my attempt of wanting to highlight the distinction between a necropolitical violence that does shorten lifespans, right? So that the stats around Palestinian women surviving Gaza five years afterwards, that they have they have 15% less chance than other women in the world. We basically set a stage that there are some populations that will just live less. So even if they've lived, they will live less, they have a shorter lifespan, right? This is a politics of death um, and it revolves around that. Um, I know this is a little bit separate, but I also, since uh, Nikki, um, when you started talking about Libya, I just wanna highlight two things that we should think about, especially now. And, and then also to add to what Asad was saying about um, what's, really, what's really going on. Um, prior to NATO's intervention in Libya, uh, there was a disarmament right there was a disarmament program which bodes you know which is very ominous for um the iranian regime but also for 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 normal iranians who are looking to this example and seeing um you know the opposite of what you said that the democrats will do good but that iran is not the threat but iran is threatened right by by conditions and by models that have been produced around it right and then to the second part of that point is that there are alternatives to sanctions on Iran, as we've seen in Trump's engagement with North Korea, which, uh, you know, despite his horrible record, I actually thought he was doing okay um, on that front, which indicates that there are um, other alternatives. And then to end by saying that, you know, and this, I, I was thinking about this today as I was thinking about this panel, this isn't the sanctions that were imposed by the Trump administration in 2019, but the ones that were imposed by Carter. So we're thinking about 42 years of sanctions. This has become uh, a, a very devastating normal. Um, and so to keep that in mind as we have these discussions and, and what it is that we demand, so. I wanted to add on uh, Nora's point when, when we're talking about the sort of uh, almost like a policy of death, right? We're just, we're just okay with the fact that in one place in the world, someone's gonna die younger because 
these are the policies that are put in place. Part of that is dehumanization. The Middle East has been dehumanized for centuries. And this, you know, Edward Said wrote Orientalism in 1978. And that argument has not changed. We're still here, and I'll give you a simple example. You know, when, you, when we saw images of protest in the US last year, when we saw in early January, uh, an insurrection on the Capitol, when we saw uh, the United States Capitol be sort of militarized, the number of commentators that said, guess what? This isn't Iraq, this isn't Syria, this isn't Iran. And these are not sort of ran random commentators. These are reputable, respectable commentators. And yet they don't understand the connection between basically what you're saying is that that violence is natural to that region, that they are naturally disposed to always being violent. Not only is it a complete lie of a group of people who are, are, not, are no more or less violent than any other people in the world, but that it completely removes the US role in that violence when we talk about it. And I think that's one of the things that we always have to think about is the role of how, how do certain policies get passed without us even like thinking about it or talking about it because people have been dehumanized. And we see that not only in our foreign policy, but absolutely in our domestic policy. And when people say things like Black Lives Matter, they have to say it because entire subsegment of Americans have been dehumanized. And so that, process of dehumanization, I think, is something that we can never separate from these conversations. And if we want to take steps to rectify that, we have to start with humanizing each other. We have to start with, with not compartmentalizing everyone into these categories and deciding these judgments. And it's sometimes shocking when you see the types of commentary that you do, um, like I said, from people who it's become second nature to do it. Thank you, Asaljan. Um, Zainab, and uh, Negar, did you guys want to comment on this uh, the, or any comments you have before we close this panel? I think Asal really put it very well and Noura, um, like the whole process of dehumanization and the inability to see really like compartmentalizing and seeing these are the other people and it's justifiable, it's fine, it's okay to kill them. And, uh, um, and it's important to make really these connections and to see how the process of dehumanization works at different levels and impacts people in different parts of the world. Thank you. Negor, this is the last. Just um, to um, go back to one of the points and maybe wrap up, it's the, and it was mentioned to some extent, the politicization of human rights, which also links back to sanctions, because a lot of these sanctions and economic sanctions, I'm not talking about human rights designations, are sold, at least here in Washington, to the public um, when they combine it with Iran's human rights violations. And there are very serious human rights violations happening in Iran on a regular basis. But to use this broad economic punishment, which in essence is a punishment of the population, as a, you know, link it to human rights when it really isn't. And when you see the behavior, the policies, the abuses of US allies in the region, and it seems like it's okay if you're a US ally that you kill, murder, chop up a journalist in a foreign uh, consulate and then pretend like it never happened, lie about it. But if you're a US foe, you're gonna get a bunch of economic sanctions piled on um, and then be linked to human rights. So it's the politicization that has unfortunately also um, led to a lack of credibility on the U.S. part as the U.S. government seen or it's not seen by a big part of the population in across the region and not just Iran as a credible um, entity, a credible authority to impose these, um, these punishments, to punish human rights fighters because there's clearly a double standard when it comes to U.S. allies and was full. And this is not just about Republicans or Democrats. Unfortunately, it's also very part of um, behavior in, in Washington. Thank you so much, Nigar. Uh, we have to wrap up. So I know there were so many questions. Thank you so much for all your questions. Uh, I'm sure you can uh, email our panelists if you have questions about uh, the points that they raised. Uh, we put the links to uh, their bios and information in the chat, uh, and you can easily find them on the internet. Um, just two reminders. First of all, 
thank you so much to all the panelists and all the chat moderators for doing all this hard work and my um, uh, co-moderator and uh, colleague and friend, um, uh, Nikki Achavan. Uh, thank you so much also for uh, those of you who participated. We are very grateful to have this solidarity. Uh, a question was about what is uh, an effective way of doing it. And I think, you know, this, this is it. The work that you all are doing, um, you know, to end the sanctions is really important. Um, two announcements. One is that please participate in our Global Day of Action on March 21st. Uh, by posting the hashtag no sanctions on Iran uh, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all your social media. Thank you, Jordan, for that. Um, and uh, also, once you do that, you can enter a raffle, win one of these beautiful no sanctions on Iran t-shirts or a tote bag or an eggplant that comes from Katoyun uh, a ceramic, a very delicate eggplant that uh, with a transliterated word Fuck you, excuse my language, I'm not supposed to say that, but in Farsi or Arabic letters, um, and that is our fuck you to sanctions and the sanction regimes and corruption. Um, so uh, you can win that also. So all you need to do is to um, tag us, tag us on social media, uh, put the no sanctions on Iran hashtag on that day. Um, and follow us. Um, uh, the information for our uh, social media is in the chat. You can find us easily uh, on the internet. We also have a YouTube channel uh, and a website that has over 40 videos of people like you who sent us videos of themselves saying why they're against the sanctions on Iran. Uh, we appreciate that solidarity. The other one is that we are a coalition in its true sense. We work with a wide range of organizations and individuals, so join our coalition. Uh, um, and one of the uh, organizations that has supported uh, our uh, day of action and also this webinar is SL's uh, organizations, National Iranian American Council. They have a week of action that starts from March 29th. So please participate also in their week of action. What we are trying to do with no sanctions on Iran is to raise some work, uh, some noise with a gra at the grassroots level. And NIAC is doing um, the work that that they have been doing, which is policy work and um, talking to uh, representatives, US representatives to encourage them to lift the sanctions on Iran to put pressure on the Biden administration. Um, so please participate, follow us on uh, both of those. And uh, we hope to uh, keep doing this until uh, the sanctions are lifted and that we can basically stop uh, uh, fighting for something that should not be in place uh, to begin with. Nikki, did you want to add anything before we close the panel? I just wanted to join you in thanking everybody. Somebody said in the chat that this panel made them cry and it is emotional to hear all these stories, but it's also energizing to see to see all of you and and to to learn and, and to keep moving forward. And the one last thing I wanna say is, as Seema said, this is a coalition in the broadest sense of the term, and it's a big tent coalition. If you agree with the things you heard today, the nitty gritty, even Seema and I don't agree on what kind of sanctions should be imposed, what shouldn't, but it, the, the bigger uh, story I think we, uh, we agree on. And if you agree with the things you heard today, we welcome you with open arms, not to sound cheesy, but we welcome you with open arms. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jordan, for helping us with the tech. Thank you, all the panelists again. Uh, and thank you, the audience. Have a wonderful list of rest of the evening or afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I think, Jordan, we can. Um,